This is FRM Part 1, Book 1, Foundations of Risk Management, and the chapter on How Do Firms Manage Financial Risk. This became one of my favorite chapters in Book 1 almost immediately because it mentioned the Black Shoals Merton option pricing model, and uh, any any chapter that talks about option pricing is uh, is really important to me. But then when uh, later on in the chapter, there's a discussion on Anheuser-Busch and the commodity price risk facing breweries. And uh, that even piqued my interest more because my father was a, uh, was a big uh, Budweiser drinker during, uh, during his lifetime. So I love this chapter. Hopefully you'll love it by the, by the time we're finished here in, in just a few minutes. It's not a real long chapter and we don't have lots of slides for you, but we do have some important learning objectives here. What we wanna do is manage risk exposure. So we'll go ahead and start off with kind of an idea of how do firms uh, handle their exposure to risk. We'll talk about risk appetite, we'll talk about uh, risk decisions, and then there's a good slide or two on advantages and disadvantages, and those are probably good things to memorize for the exam. And then we'll talk a little bit about operational and financial risks. And then, of course, we'll end with kind of a conversation on derivatives. So let's go ahead and start with what essentially is the middle part of this chapter. But we've decided to put this at the beginning so that you get a good sense and a good flavor of how businesses and banks and other financial institutions manage risk exposure. And there are probably four different ways to do this. Um, the easiest of the way uh, to manage risk is to just accept it. Now, this doesn't mean that we're going to go stick our head in the sand and say, oh boy, we just hope for the best. But accepting the risk, notice what we have in that first block point there. It means an understanding of the given risk. It means an acknowledgement that the risk, and it means that we are aware that we're going to retain it. So if we accept the risk, there's no attempt to either eliminate the risk or to lessen or mitigate the risk. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and use some basic economics principles <clears throat> and some basic finance principles to make this decision to accept risk. Look at that first uh, diamond point. Uh, let's go ahead and compare the marginal cost of the risk mitigation strategy versus the marginal benefit of just accepting the risk. And so what we need to do is compare marginal costs and marginal benefits. And then our finance lesson is that, you know, what we wanna do is we're gonna say something like, you know what, uh, there are always some positive outcomes if we're going to accept the risk. I mean, let's suppose that we're, uh, uh, that we're a commercial bank and we've made lots of loans to uh, fixed loans, fixed rate loans, you know, to, for residential mortgages. Well, what is our risk? Our interest rate risk is that interest rates go way up and we're left holding uh, a loan that's only paying us, you know, five or 6% when interest rates are 10 or 12%. But, but, we need to be aware of the simple fact that interest rates could fall to 1% or 2% or 0%. And then we're reaping the positive rewards of locking into that higher fixed, uh, that higher fixed rate, comma. Of course, we have to worry about people refinancing their mortgages. And then lastly, it's possible to pass those costs on to our client base or our customers or any kind of a consumer that's out there. All right, the second way is just to avoid the risk. I tell my students this all the time. Look, if it's raining outside and you don't want to get wet, well, then just stay inside. Uh, so avoiding the risk, but, you know, this is probably not, uh, this is probably relevant for, for some activities, some business activities, but not for, not for all business activities. I mean, you know, what is the risk of, let's just say, distributing debit cards to, uh, our retail banking customers, and the answer is among all the risk that you know there could be a breach of our secure data system and also security numbers and all addresses and any other kind of private information could be hacked. Um, so you know, it's a lot of times we can't avoid that risk. We we want to manage it. We want to manage it. 
Then of course we can we can lessen the risk. Let's call that mitigating the risk. We can reduce the probability of occurrence, and there are lots of different ways that we can do this. And we'll probably talk about those, you know, throughout the next chapters, and uh, maybe even through the next books. Um, but one of the easiest ways for would be for us to say something like going back to my example with the retail mortgage residential loans. We could just say something like, you know what. Uh, we're going to require you to have 50% down payment on the loan. Now, 50%, that's probably not reasonable, but, you know, something more than, you know, maybe what uh, the government bodies are asking us to do or the secondary markets in securitization, additional collateral. And of course, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be uh, an extra down payment. It could be something like, you know what? I see that you have this beautiful painting uh, hanging in your living room. How about if you turn the, uh, turn the ownership of that over to us until you get to a 50% uh, uh, equity position in your home. So additional collateral. And then of course, my favorite, and you should have guessed this based on my, uh, my love for the Black-Scholes-Merton option pricing model, we can transfer the risk through legal and binding contracts. I just mentioned uh, securitization here just a few moments ago. But uh, the majority of these are going to be through uh, contracts like an insurance contract or a derivative contract. Then, of course, whenever you transfer risk and you eliminate risk or you lessen the risk, then you bring up you bring in some other kind of risk. So we have the third party risk here. So let me just go back here quickly. So here's a great exam questions. You think about it. Uh, you know, there's a question stem and you have four choices, except avoid, mitigate or transfer. And then somewhere in the question stem, you know, they'll give you an idea of, of what that policy is. So you ought to be able to answer those four questions. All right, let's go ahead and swing back to the beginning of this chapter and talk about the relationship between risk appetite and risk management decisions. So let's go ahead and start with some definitions. So this risk profile is a firm or a bank's current risk exposure. Risk capacity, on the other hand, is probably some ceiling. It's probably some maximum amount that the organization is uh, able to, to take. You know, so think about this. We have a risk profile and then we have a risk capacity. I'll show you this in a, in a slide here in just a second. And so, you know, what do we want to do? We have this risk profile here and we have the ceiling here. What do we do with that, with that middle ground? And that has everything to do with our risk appetite. So risk appetite, the type and amount of risk that the commercial bank or the financial institution is prepared to pursue, retain or take. Two, two items that go into a risk appetite. So clearly there should be a written document. Sometime in uh, one of these books, in one of these future chapters, we're gonna talk about uh, the chief risk officer. We're gonna talk about uh, the risk profile. We're gonna talk about the appetite for risk, all in the context of the board of directors and the chief risk officer. Now we'll, we have a slide on the board here in just a few minutes. So we need this risk appetite statement that says something like, you know what, here's our business, Here, here's our core competencies. So here's our, here are our business risks. And then we might have some other kind of risk around this. And here, let's identify these risks and then let's figure out what we, uh, what we wanna do in terms of our appetite. You know, are we, are we going to nibble at it right? Nibble at it like a, like a trout does when you're trying to catch a trout in a stream. And boy, that, uh, that trout is just fooling around with you, right? He nibbles at the worm and nibbles at the worm. And you can, uh, you have to really struggle to catch him. Or is it going to be like uh, my favorite movie out there, Jaws, where the shark comes and just, uh, you know, gobbles everything up. So risk appetite, remember, trout all the way to Jaws. And what is our appetite? That's going to be determined by, of course, the risk culture that is established by the board and the chief risk officer. And then, of course, the second component are these mechanisms to handle not just day to day operations, but weekly and monthly over you know whatever time period that we think is relevant. But wherever we put together some type of a document, maybe it's just a simple financial statement, we need to have 
risk specific statements in there. Now, of course, we're not going to you know, write them all over our debits and our credits, but you know, we have this management discussion section, we have the notes, we have all sorts of ways to include our risk appetite into documents that are that are presented to you know anybody really who's interested and call them all the different kinds of stakeholders here's that little illustration that i was telling you about so there's the risk profile down there in the purple risk capacity up at the top and so uh, there's risk appetite somewhere somewhere in the middle uh, I, I think an interesting part of this illustration is the dotted lines probably upper and lower trigger points so as long as we're somewhere somewhere in the middle that we're probably managing the risk according to all of the documents that we just described if we get too high or too low then we probably need to have kind of a conversation about it and then may, maybe we need to report it to our stakeholders uh, i love this slide i love this section of the chapter this is a working risk management framework. So what we're going to do is we're going to start over on the right hand upper corner, identify risk appetite. So what we need to do is we need to identify all of all of the risks. And so let's suppose we're a commercial bank and uh, to make life simple, we accept applications from all of the commercial businesses in the area who need to borrow money and we do uh, our diligence and we extend loans and let's suppose they're all fixed rate loans so these are commercial loans with a fixed rate they have two years or five years maybe 10 years whatever those are and they fit here let me go back here quick and they fit right into that risk appetite so what are we exposed to we're exposed to and let's just make it simple Let's, we're exposed to interest rate risk. So how are we going, we've identified that interest rate risk and you know there are other risks out there as well, but let's go ahead and just focus on that one. So then we're gonna map this particular risk and we can do mapping in a variety of ways. How about if I just give you just a quick example here, think of an Excel spreadsheet where we have at the micro level, so we have a, a separate file, a separate Excel, Excel spreadsheet for every loan that we make. So somewhere down here over in the left middle of the spreadsheet, we have the uh, initial amount of the loan, say it's a million dollars. And then we put together an interest rate tree. We're going to talk about interest rate trees, oh my gosh, for uh, book one and two and 10 and 20. And when we get all the way to the end, you're going to love interest rate trees. But all we're saying here now is we're going to say the value of the loan depends on interest rates. So if interest rates go up, then the value of the loan goes down. If interest rates go down, the value of the loan goes up. And we built that we build this mapping using an Excel spreadsheet during different interest rate paths. So we're mapping these risks so that we can say something like, look, if interest rates go up by, you know, let's say 10 basis points over the next week and then 10 more basis points over the next week. And so we can do this weekly. So think about what this mapping does for us. What it does is it says, you know what, regardless of what interest rate path that we're faced with over the next two or five years, we know exactly what's going to be the value of our loan based on those interest rate pass and then we'll have to put in some uh, some present value model to compute the value uh, of that loan and mapping can be done with excel mapping can be done with uh, cash flows it can be done in all different sorts of ways just think about mapping as, as a map you know uh, you know, nowadays we all have our phones, but back when I first started driving, I had a map, you know, and I would have to open it up and say, okay, what state am I in and what roads do I have to take? And so actually seeing the physical paper of a map really kind of helps me understand the mapping of the risk management process. All right, so we have all that stuff and then we're gonna activate our risk appetite. And so let me just go back here. We're gonna activate this based on the dotted lines that are above, dotted lines are below, relevant to our risk profile, being aware of what that ceiling is. And then we're gonna implement the plan. We're gonna say something like, okay, this is what we know. So the next customers, the next clients, uh, the next borrowers that come into our office, we have all of these known risks mapped. We've linked them to our risk appetite. And so now this is going to help us. Are you ready for this? This is so cool. This is going to help us identify 
a more appropriate interest rate for that particular loan. So implementing the plan, notice where, you know, we're not moving, you know, the arrows kind of tell us that we're moving from one step to the next step, but, you know, we're really kind of coordinating and coagulating. Is that a word? We're still considering all these steps along the way. Then we implement the plan and then we sit back and we just say, okay, let's see what happens. We're going to monitor and we're going to make adjustments because let's go back to the Excel spreadsheet. You know, what did I say? We, we were going to see what happens if interest rates change by 10 basis points in a week. Well, suppose that during that third week that interest rates fall by 35 basis points and we look at our model, we look at our mapping and say, wait a minute, we didn't do that. So that mapping is way more complex than what I had just described. What we'll probably do is have a separate file for each loan and we'll probably have multiple maps, multiple interest rate trees to be able to identify 30 and 20 and what I say, 35 and 45 and 100 basis point uh, interest rate changes. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take all those distributions and we're going to lay them together and get, you know, let's call it for lack of a better word right now, a combined distribution for the portfolio or all in the aggregate of all the loans that we make to the businesses in our surrounding area. So monitor and adjust. Here we go. I mentioned board of directors and chief risk officer just a few moments ago. And so what do we have in bolded up there? Define the firm's appetite for risk. And, and this might be even more important, communicate this to everybody out there, right? In conjunction with the chief risk officer and then the other executive team members. And then of course this trickles down to all of the supervisors, which then trickles into all of the different silos uh, that we have inside of our business. And of course, we need to define this both for our quantitative models and then, you know, our surveys and our attitudes and our monitoring of uh, social media. So any kind of a qualitative manner. Of course, what we can do is uh, we can we can look primarily at value at risk or we can look at other other risk measures. But the reason that value at risk is so popular is because it specifies a maximum loss at a given level of confidence. And we could have a conversation and maybe even a heated discussion, perhaps even an argument about what is the appropriate given level of confidence. But once again, that goes back to uh, the board of directors determination of the appetite for risk. Some boards might say 95% confidence. Some boards might say 99% confidence and some boards might say hundred percent confidence, in which case we should just say, all right, if people buy our shares of stock, they'll buy it a hundred and sell it 102 next year because we're not taking any risk. Now the board of course is going to have to identify and communicate and state how the firm treats each risk. Those four things that we started out at the, that very first slide. And then constantly evaluating plausible scenarios. This is why that mapping is so important because in that mapping, not only are you going to have static variables that are inputted into the model today, but then we have this whole plausible scenarios. And I don't really know what the term plausible means. How many of us thought uh, COVID was plausible? How many thought that the uh, tremendous spike in inflation in 2021 was plausible. So I'm going to go ahead and say, let's evaluate plausible and, and those low probability, uh, uh, high loss scenarios as well. So make sure that you, that you include both of those. Uh, how about right sizing risk management? Uh, this is really a fascinating concept, but it's really based on on some level of common sense. Let me go back to my example. What did I say earlier that, look, if you don't want to get wet, then don't go out in the rain. But think about it this way, right sizing. So let's suppose that we decide to go out in the rain. What we can do is we can carry around a little tiny umbrella that they put in those drinks, right? I don't know what drinks get an umbrella, but you see them in movies. So we could put that over there. So clearly we're eliminating the risk 
by eliminating the raindrops falling on just the very top of our head, right? Or maybe we put it on our shoulder. All right, that's a silly example. So maybe we could use one of those uh, umbrellas that fold up that my wife puts in her car, it folds up and you open it up and you know, it just barely, uh, barely covers her shoulders. Or we could get a regular sized umbrella and maybe that covers, you know, let's say five inches outside. Or we could go to the extreme and get a golf umbrella, which goes way out. You know, you see Tiger Woods when he's ever he's playing in the rain. You know, he's got this gigantic umbrella out there so that uh, so that nothing on his uh, on his person. How's that for a uh, term gets wet? Or how about an even more extreme case? We get a beach umbrella and carry that around. All right, so you get the sense of right sizing uh, risk management. Think of it as a scale from zero percent to a hundred percent. Do we want to do we want to manage and eliminate one hundred percent of our risk, or seventy percent, or fifty percent, or thirty percent? I was fascinated to read in this. Uh, in this chapter, an article, I'm sorry, a chapter on how the airlines manage their commodity price risk with their jet fuel. I give this story to my students all the time. I say something like, there are a couple of airlines out there who are very aggressive and they hedge about 70 or 75% of their commodity price risk with an oil futures contract. But there are many of them that hedge maybe 10% or 20%. Some, some even hedge 0%. You know, so think about it. This is what we're talking about with right sizing risk management. Uh, and this, of course, comes from the direction and the strategic plan of the board of directors. And then the chief risk officer decides, okay, 82% is the optimal or 71%, whatever it is. So how do, how do we do this? How does the chief risk officer do this? Well, understand the business, focus on the key risks, clarify roles and responsibilities, and then you know, try to figure out if there is a gap. So if we're doing, if we're, if our, if our risk management right size tells us that in general, we want to manage 50 or we want to reduce 50% of our risk. Well, there's going to be a gap, right? Because sometimes commodity prices or interest rates or whatever we're trying to hedge is going to move in our favor. It's going to move against us. So there's probably going to be some kind of a gap in there. And then we, then we need to manage, manage that gap. All right, I said to you earlier about the uh, about the Excel spreadsheet is a great way to map, but there are other ways. And so, you know, what we can do this, we can do it graphically. And, you know, in Excel, there are tons and tons of graphs and there's software. You can you can put together all sorts of illustrations, but it's probably going to be a, a response and highlighting some hierarchical format. And uh, the reading does mention cash impact and probability of occurrence. And so you think about uh, you think about what this means. Cash impact. That's one. That's one. Uh, that's one item. And then probability of occurrence. And we're going to talk about probabilities throughout uh, throughout all the chapters uh, in the FRM program, and those probabilities of occurrence and how we're going to calculate those probabilities. And sometimes I'll probably have you scratching your head saying, "All right, that doesn't really help me out at all, Jim." But sometimes we'll be able to say, "You know what? This is the best way to do this." Look at that fourth uh, block point. This is what I was saying earlier. We can have this Excel spreadsheet or cash impact or probabilities. We can do this at the individual level, like I was telling you earlier, or at the portfolio or aggregate level. And we're probably going to do this with uh, all, all these different kinds of risks. So, you know, just imagine how many Excel spreadsheets you can have open. How many cash impact illustrations can you have? Now, go ahead and read inside of the box there. You know, what we're doing is we're mapping out existing positions. And this probably is going to include insurance contracts. It's probably going to include derivative contracts. And we're probably going to be worried about are these contracts or these existing positions, what is the cash flow that's going to occur at the next period? And at that next period, we need to focus on that and we need to say something like, all right, do we need to hedge that? And so in order to do that, we need to have a great background in economics because all these risks are related to what's going on in the underlying economy. I mean, you know, you think about it. if the economy is expanding and say, say uh, GDP is growing at, let's say, 5%, you know, would that our current economy would be growing at 5%. But this is all 
pretty much good news for everybody out there. But remember, there are pockets of bad news in growing economies. Maybe it has to do with the level of interest rates. Maybe it has to do with the currency values. So there are all different sorts of subtleties inside of this risk mapping. Uh, benefits of mapping. Take a closer look at risks uh, that they don't usually consider. Oh, wow, that's really important here. Thorough understanding. And then, of course, enterprise risk management, where we're going to take a look at, uh, you know, what's going on at the aggregate level, at the enterprise level, and how each of those silos contributes to, you know, I always think it uh, as, a, as, as a big umbrella. All right, I've used this word uh, risk management and hedging a few times here. So let's go ahead and talk about this uh, uh, in some more detail. So what are we doing? Hedging means that we have an underlying position in some type of an asset. So let's just take the simple example. If we're a farmer and we grow corn, what's our natural position in the corn market? We want to work really hard and we want to harvest the corn and we want to get $10 for an ear of corn, right? So we're naturally long in the spot market. So what that means is that we benefit when the price of the underlying asset, in this case, the price of spot corn increases. But what happens if we do all this work and we harvest and we go to the farmer's market with, you know, a thousand bushels of corn and we're not the only farmer there. There are a million farmers. There are a billion ears of corn. And so they sell for one penny. So what do we do? We sell our ears of corn for one penny and we go back home and we have to tell our family, uh, sorry, we won't be eating at all over the winter. So that's our motivation for hedging is to eliminate or to mitigate that downside risk. So what this means is that we're going to use some other market, maybe a derivative market. We're going to use some other market and we're going to bet against ourselves. So this is the way I want you to think about it. So if you're if you're long in the spot market like the corn farmer, then you're going to take the opposite short position in the derivatives market. And what that's going to do is that gains in one market are going to be offset by losses in another market. And the idea is that you just don't know which market. Now, if you're a corn farmer and you use a corn futures contract, the two assets are the same corn in the spot market corn in the futures market. And if you harvest the corn on the exact date that the futures contract matures, you can arrange what is known as a perfect hedge, meaning that you completely eliminate commodity price risk. Now, it's difficult to get a perfect hedge. And so we need to worry about other types of risk. We'll talk about basis risk here in, in just a second. But the idea here in this very early chapter here is to understand that we can use these hedging instruments to substantially reduce or, in fact, eliminate whatever risk that we're being faced. All right, so let's go through these. We can swap. So uh, what we can do is we can take a position and swap cash flows that we're receiving for cash flows that we would like to receive. Here's the quick example that I always give my students. Let's suppose that I have a peach tree in my backyard and every day I go out and I pick a peach and I come in and I slice it up and I have it with a raisin bran and I have a great breakfast. But every day I go out and I look over at my neighbor's house and he or she has an apple tree, honey crisp apples. All oh, these are the greatest apples out there. So he's probably getting sick of eating apples every morning. I'm getting sick of eating peaches every morning. Well, why don't we just swap? I mean, I could go to the expense and the, and the labor of planting an apple tree in my backyard, but uh, what do I know about apples? I know everything about peaches. He doesn't know anything about peaches. So doesn't, you see, it benefits both of us to swap. So one day I'll go out and say, here, here's a peach. He'll throw me an apple over the fence. Now we're happy. I still have my peaches, but now I have an apple. And this is all a swap contract is. Now, of course, we're not going to swap actual physical commodities, but we could swap the cash flows. So what we could do is we could swap the return on a peach versus the return on an apple. And then we could take the difference and I could go out and buy an apple. 
Ah, so we're going to swap over the counter until or when the contract matures. And you can swap almost anything. You can swap fixed for floating interest rates. You can swap floating for floating uh, currency values. You can swap floating uh, return on the stock market versus a fixed dividend payment. I mean, swap markets are really, really cool. And, uh, and they provide opportunities for hedging for lots and lots of investors out there. A forward contract is super simple. All we're going to do is we're going to agree to trade an asset at some time in the future. What we could do is say something like, hey, I have this keyboard right here. Can you guys see my keyboard? Here's the keyboard. And so in, in, uh, in six months, I'm not going to need this keyboard because I'm going to buy a new computer. You, you don't need this keyboard for six months. And so what we agree to do is I'll agree to sell it to you. And I'll say, look, in six months, you can come by and pay me five dollars for this uh, uh, for this keyboard. So in six months, you show up at my front door, you hand me five dollars and I hand you this keyboard. Regardless here, there's the cool thing, regardless of what the price of this keyboard is, what the spot price of this keyboard is in what did I say? Six months. So forward contracts are super critical for managing risk for farmers for commercial banks and their exposure to interest rates and international companies who use uh, currency forwards. But the drawback of a forward contract, and we'll learn this at length as we move through the program, is that they are customized for each client. Like you and I are going to trade this keyboard. Who, who else wants this keyboard? I mean, maybe somebody else, but maybe you like this keyboard and it's my keyboard. So it's customized or tailored to fit our needs. And that's why sometime in 1848 and through the 1850s, and then I think the first year of trading uh, a standardized futures contract on the Chicago, Mort uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange was, I think, 1864. Futures contracts are identical to forward contracts in any, every, every way, except they're standardized and they are traded on an exchange. So it eliminates, they have a huge market uh, secondary market. So it eliminates those losses for default that were common back in uh, the 18 and 1900s under forward contract and still are today, by the way. Advantages of hedging. I, I probably mentioned some of these. So reduced capital, uh, reduced capital costs. Um, you know, what did you learn back in your uh, undergraduate finance course that uh, goal of the business is always to maximize shareholder wealth? One way to do that is to minimize the weighted average cost of capital. And one way that this chapter discusses about minimizing the weighted average cost of capital is to reduce the volatility of earnings. And so there's one thing, reduce capital cost, Capital protection, of course, what did I say in that perfect hedge? We're locking in a future value of our corn. Cash flow benefit. Here's the example in this, uh, this, this paragraph that the chapter talks about an airline that hedges the price of jet fuel is able to smooth out, uh, smooth out its, uh, its revenues and expenses. Uh, one of the interesting things about the airline and the challenge of hedging is that there is no futures contract on jet fuel, but there's a futures contract on an oil. So this can never be a perfect hedge. So remember what I was talking about with right sized, uh, right sized risk management? Well, there's right sized hedging because uh, the correlation coefficient between jet fuel and oil, it's probably close to one, but it's not one. So they're not going to be a perfect hedge. Yeah, predictability, of course, you can you can lock in a future price and you can do this with forward and futures and swap contracts and then better governance. So let's swing back to what we were saying about the board of directors. When the board establishes uh, this risk appetite, whatever it is, then within that framework, it's better able to govern and uh, apply all those strategic risk management principles. Of course, hedging is not free. There are some costs associated with it. Um, there might be, you know, I always am concerned about insufficient flexibility because we could have mentioned flexibility here under cash flow benefit uh, and reduced capital cost. 
but there is some inflexibility with these because uh, they they're going there's going to be the opportunity for you to say something like boy I wish I didn't use that hedge because if I hadn't I would have made tons and tons of money so the chapter talks about reducing your potential profits uh, complexity I always give this example to my students somewhere in the early 1990s uh, there was a company out there who decided to hedge. Are you ready for this? They decided to hedge about $40 million in their interest costs. And so they hired an investment banking firm. They came up with this really complex derivative contract. And uh, the derivative contract would have been beneficial for every party involved unless now this was back when we didn't have the euro it was a german mark unless the german mark versus the us dollar fell within this range coupled with interest rates falling with this within this range and so of course of course this was uh, this happened that the interest rates fell within this range and the german mark value against the us dollar fell within that range and um so Procter & Gamble lost $400 million on this derivative because they were trying to hedge $40 million. So what, what does the reading tell you about here? Too complicated to analyze. Actually, it's kind of a comical story that Procter & Gamble sued. It's called Bankers Trust back in those days. They sued Bankers Trust. Bankers Trust sued Procter & Gamble, and it was a big litigation. And, uh, you know, I can't really remember what happened. But, uh, you know, it was a disaster because, because what did we say early on here? You know, the identifying of the risks and mapping out all of those potential outcomes, clearly neither party mapped out uh, what was going on. Now, the complexity also uh, can be layered with the difficulty in pricing derivatives. I mean, look, we can use the Black-Scholes-Merton option pricing model all we want, and that's a terrific model. But you probably know this better than I do, that every investment banking firm has their own kind of proprietary Black-Scholes-Merton option pricing model that, you know, kind of tweaks a little bit because there are some variables in there, especially the volatility measure as an input variable that uh, nobody really knows uh, much about it. Unintended risk, so there's wrong way risk uh, among others. Wrong way risk is the, the idea that, uh, you know, let's suppose I'm your third party and you start piling on all of these derivatives in my direction and you're winning on every one and you're thinking, hey, this is great, but that increases my probability of default. And so the more you think you're going to win, the more likely that I'm going to run away and never show up uh, at the closing of that derivative contract. That's wrong way risk. All right, how about challenges when uh, implementing this hedging strategy? Look at that first sentence that we've written up there. A lot can go wrong. Just think about Procter & Gamble. So, boy, let's do these. You know, we can do these fairly quickly. I think I've mentioned some of these. A company might misunderstand the type of risk, fail to map or overlook changes. Ah, so what does this mean? This means that we're not right-sizing. We're either over-hedging or we're under-hedging. And then are we using uh, some kind of a model? I mean, there are different models that we can uh, try to value a swap and we could map everything out on the right hand side of our Excel spreadsheet. But what if our swap pricing model is it stinks and then we have all this mapping out there and we can say something like, OK, here's our path and we should be right here. But then we look in the market and we're way, way up here or way, way down here. And so that model is uh, model risk. Uh, without a robust corporate governance system. All right, so this is this is really important. Going back to our conversation about the board and the chief risk officer and its and his or her responsibilities, if you don't have a robust, you know, what does that word robust mean? Robust means that, okay, we've considered everything out there. Uh, you know, whenever I think of robust, this is a big word in statistics, of course, and I was going on through my dissertation and then, you know, I'm thinking, okay, if I would have were to have done a robust strategy, a robust test on my decision to get married 30 some years ago, I probably would have uh, passed out from having a migraine, you know, so you can't you can't have all you can't consider all of those possibilities. But you want to get inside of that. Boy, what word did I use earlier that I didn't like, you know, the plausible re re uh, region, 
Now, of course, my 30 some years of marriage has been uh, super delightful. So let me go ahead and say that there. But we've had our ups and downs, of course. And then how about the fourth one there? Poor communication or inadequate disclosure. So this goes back to this goes back to the board of directors and the responsibilities of the uh, CRO to be an excellent communicator and have all of these uh, all these disclosures. And the chapter has a couple of good examples. Uh, you can read those if you want. All right, what kind of risks are out there? Pricing risks. So this is what I talked about with commodity price risk, of course, uh, equity price risk, fixed income price risk. And so what we can do, we can use forward contracts and futures contracts and uh, and swap contracts to go ahead and lock in that favorable price that we can either sell or buy at some time in the future. And this, of course, is exactly, exactly what goes on in the foreign currency market. But instead of trying to lock in a price of, let's say, corn that we said or earlier, or, or barley for Anheuser-Busch and all the beer uh, manufacturers, you know, what we're trying to do is lock in the value of a currency. And so you think about foreign currency risk, you know, let's suppose that we're Anheuser-Busch and we sell tons and tons of beer, beer over in Europe. Well, we're going to repatriate those cash flows back to U.S. dollars. And so what, what are we hoping? We're hoping that we repatriate them back to lots of U.S. dollars rather than fewer U.S. dollars. So for foreign currency risk management, we're going to use forward contracts. We're going to use futures contracts, and we're going to use uh, call options and put options as well, because what those put and call options do is they allow us to benefit if the prices move in our favor. Now, of course, call and put options, they, they're not free, and they, they can be quite salty in, in their prices. Let me go ahead and confess that my undergraduate degree is in accounting. And so I do remember not liking my accounting class as much when I was an undergraduate student, but I did learn some things. And one of the things that stuck with me, and this probably helped me in my master's program, and I have, I have an MS in finance, I don't, I don't have an MBA. And then of course, when I was getting my PhD, is that you have this mismatch between uh, assets and liabilities. And this is super important, of course, for commercial banks. And there are ways to manage this mismatch between, you know, let's say the time of the maturity of the assets and the time of the maturity of the liabilities or the currency that these are valued at depending on where our uh, where our foreign markets are and so uh, this is super easy to use forward contracts of course but it's also super easy to use a currency swap to balance sheet hedge and then I think I mentioned a couple of examples about interest rate risk. If we have uh, if we are holding a loan that has a fixed rate or we're holding a loan that has a floating rate, we're at risk to interest rates going up or down. That's why that interest rate tree is so valuable. So we can use uh, uh, we can use a forward contract, but we're probably going to use a forward rate agreement. You'll love these when we talk about those. And then uh, and then an interest rate futures contract. Now, how about uh, this impact of risk management tools uh, on our set of constraints that we're faced with? So look down, look down uh, the left-hand column and think about yourself as the chief risk officer or uh, sitting on the board. And notice that these words down the left-hand column, most of them have the term limit. All of them have the term limit. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to get our vice out and we're trying to turn the vice. So we're squeezing it so that in a perfect hedge, we're going to completely eliminate risk, but we're going to turn our muscles and we're going to try to get this down to some acceptable level. Remember that whole conversation on risk appetite that we had? Boy, what's it been now? 30 minutes or so? All right, so what can we do? We can have these stop loss limits. So what this simply means is if the price of some asset hits some value, you know, depending on whether we have the long or short position, whether it's high or low, we'll just go ahead and make sure that we execute that trade. Stop loss limits. Uh, notional limits. This is what I was talking about with a futures contract and with a swap contract. Um, 
look, the financial institutions are going to ask you, now they'll probably give you some advice, but they're going to ask you, what notional principle do you want? What notional amount do you want on your swap contract? And I tell my students this all the time. I say, look, if you ever invent a time machine, come to me. And what we're going to do is we're going to get in our time machine and we're going to go back one day in time. We're going to get a Wall Street Journal and we're going to take a look at what is an interest rate, what is uh, uh, what is the currency value and what is inflation. And we're going to come back to uh, we're going to come back to today and I'm going to say something like, oh, I'm going to use that information in the past and I'm going to try to extrapolate that, that out into the future by, of course, yesterday I went ahead and took that position because when I uh, went back in time, I knew what the spot prices are today. So when I arrive at today, I'm going to be an instant billionaire. So I tell my students, I say, look, yesterday when we go to the financial institution, we want a notional amount of a trillion dollars. Now, nobody's going to give a college professor a notional amount of a trillion dollars, but I could do my best to work really hard to get it in the billions. All right, specific limits on risk like credit risk, maybe we want to say something like uh, we'll only accept an investment in uh, investment graded bonds. You know, I used to, uh, in the old days, I served on a, the investments committee of a not-for-profit. And in our policy statement, we had a, uh, a line in there that says, we will permit our wealth manager to buy double B rated bonds, but nothing less. So nearly, nearly investment graded bonds, um, maturity limits or gap limits. And so this has a couple of implications that, of course, when we're doing this mapping, that near term cash flow is probably our most important one. But then what we want to do is we want to say, OK, do we want to kind of I don't want to call it pre hedge, but we, do we want to hedge the next one and the next one and the next one, whatever that is. So we're going to put a cap on those number of contracts. And then concentration limits, you know, think about this as diversification. You know, do we want to just go to that person over there and have all of our contracts with that particular person at that particular financial institution? And then there's a list of weaknesses over on the right hand side. I'm sure you read those as I was going over the description. Now, when we're dealing with option contracts, we have to worry about the Greeks. We need to worry about Delta and Gamma and Theta. And Vega, you know, Delta, I always teach my students about that one. I always teach about Vega with uh, with volatility. And so those potential weaknesses over on the right hand side, this goes back to what we were talking about with uh, poor model uh, creation. We'll talk at length about value at risk. What we need to do is determine what that level of confidence is going to be and what kind of threshold and then what is going to be our plan? What is going to be our plan if, in fact, uh, we lose more than whatever that value at risk? Remember, value at risk tells us the maximum loss 95 percent of the time or 97 and a half percent of the time. Once again, there's some model risks as well. Uh, how about this? Stress tests, sensitivity analysis, scenario analysis. I talk about the, uh, this with my students all the time. I love these things because I say to my students, look, what's the worst thing that can happen to you? What's the best thing that can happen to you? And then let's pick a whole bunch of stuff that's in between. And so, you know, scenario analysis can include just those just those two extremes, or it can include, you know, maybe uh, every 10% all the way up from zero to 100%. And then what you do is you throw some stressors in there. You say, oh, let's suppose we have an oil price spike. And of course, we're relying on our mapping, relying on our mapping. And so you have to write a macro in the Excel program. And you say, okay, we have this stressor of, a, of an uh, oil price spike. How does this impact the value of our portfolio throughout all the mapping? And then, of course, with sensitivity analysis, what we can do is we can change each individual input and say, OK, if this changes by 42 basis points, then here's all the outcome. Notice what we have down the bottom right hand uh, under potential weaknesses. Very difficult to cover all possible scenarios. And I tell my students, I say something like, you know, here we are in this academic environment. Clearly, we're not going to cover all of even the most likely scenarios, but I always test them on it. I'm saying uh, in the, when you go work for an investment banking firm or a commercial bank, uh, 
you're going to want to cover all possible scenarios within reason. Once again, we're doing marginal costs, marginal benefits. Uh, derivatives too have their limits. You know, I, I tell my students regularly that these are awesome securities. These are awesome hedging tools. These are awesome speculative tools, but they're not perfect. And uh, oftentimes they're even less perfect than what we hope them to be. So what was I saying earlier? And this is what, uh, what the chapter tells you about inside of that blue box there. What the airlines do is they use a, they use a future futures contract on the price of oil, but their input is jet fuel. So the correlation coefficient between those two underlying assets is not going to be one. Maybe it's 0.9, maybe it's 0.8, uh, but this is called basis risk. I used that term just a few moments ago. And so the changes in the spot of jet fuel and the changes in the spot of oil are not going to perfectly match. Notice what we have in the paragraph there. Do not move in lockstep. What that means is that their correlation coefficients are not one. And so that means that they are not fully insulated. How about that for a term? This is basis risk that when you think you're locking in a price, what you're doing is instead of locking in, you know, you're doing this vice. So in a perfect hedge, you get to this point right here. But with an imperfect hedge, you have basis risk. Oh boy, no matter how strong your muscles are, you're only getting to this point right here. But still, still, that's way more acceptable than doing nothing and having that much risk. And that takes us through this chapter. We've done all of those learning objectives. Um, I, I'm going to say that each of those is probably equally important. So thank you for watching and good luck studying.